Hey guys, it's Kay, I hope you're all well. Now in today's video, I'm gonna look at my top five projects for the Raspberry Pi 4. Now there's something for everyone in this video. The projects include gaming, media consumption, and a little bit of tinkering with the Raspberry Pi 4. So without further ado, let's get on with it. If you're new to the channel and you wanna stay up to date with the latest tech tutorials, reviews, and unboxings, I do everything including Fire Stick, Raspberry Pi, and Android TV tips and tricks. So subscribe and hit the notification button. Now in today's video, I want to look at installing Android TV 11 on your Raspberry Pi 4 or Pi 400. Now, as you can see here, I've got a Raspberry Pi 4 running Android TV 11. And to be perfectly honest, it's running very smoothly and it's handling everything I'm throwing at it. And that includes media, gaming. Now, to get Android TV running on the Raspberry Pi, we need to use a special build of Lineage OS. And thanks to Kongster Kang and his team, that's exactly what we're going to do. The only issue of this Android TV build on your Raspberry Pi is that it doesn't have support for hardware video decoding and encoding, but it does feature hardware accelerated graphics, which means you should be able to run most apps as long as they don't rely on video decoding. So as you can see, video works very well, and I think we're at 1080p here, working smoothly. Now you can see YouTube's working pretty well, no issues, all very fluid, and there were no problems with signing into my account. Now gaming also works flawlessly and I was able to download a couple of games. Now this is a car game I downloaded. And you can see the graphics and sound all work flawlessly together. There's no lags or stuttering. And surprisingly I got a lot of fun out of this shot game. Now to get this installed on your Raspberry Pi 4, we're going to need to download a few files. So open up your browser and head on over to kongstakang.com. And on the top right corner, you'll see a menu. Just scroll down to Raspberry Pi 4 and select it. And here we can see we've got all different versions of Android going all the way back to version 9. Now I have done a video of how to install Android TV 10 and Android 10 on your Raspberry Pi 4. And I'll leave a link in the description below where you can watch this. But for this video, we're going to choose Android TV 11. And we get a brief introduction from Kongster Kang telling us it's his build of Lineage 18.1 for Android TV. And we just need to scroll down until we get to his download link. Click on it and it will take you to another page to download his version of Lineage. Click on Start Download and you'll get a selection of mirror sites and I just chose the closest one to me. Then we just go back to the main Kongstakan download page and there's one more file we need to download. So just scroll down and keep going down until you get to the section where it says how to install gapps. And this is going to tell us how to install Google Play Store on our Android TV install. And it basically just involves installing the correct version of gapps onto your Android installation. And in this case, we need to download the version with TV stock in its name. Okay, so if we click on the Open GApps link there, we'll be directed to the SourgeForge download page, and we need to find the correct version. So let's click on the latest folder, and we're looking for a file with TV stock in its file name, and it looks like it's the top one, which is the latest one. And it will begin downloading automatically once it's counted down. Okay, so you can see I've got my two files here. I've got my Lineage version 18.1, and I've got my GApps TV stock version. Now we need to get the Lineage operating system onto an SD card. And to do this, I'm using the Raspberry Pi Imager. All downloads in the description below, guys. And the first thing we do is choose Operating System. And we scroll down to Custom. And then browse to where you downloaded the file. And you just select it. And then choose the SD card you've got selected in your PC. And the final thing you do is click on Write. And finally confirm. Now this can take anywhere up to 10 minutes. And you should get a final message when it's done. Now the other thing we're going to do is transfer a copy of the GApps we downloaded onto a USB stick. And we're going to use this to install GApps once we've got Lineage installed on the Raspberry Pi. Now once you've done that, you can go ahead and insert the SD card into your Raspberry Pi and boot up. Now the first boot will take a few minutes, so just bear with it. Okay, so once you're in, you can see it's pretty bare at the moment. So this is Android 11 without the Google Play Store. But we can add a few things to spice it up. And the first thing we're going to do is add a couple of favourites. And we're going to add the file manager. And we're also going to add the settings. To add the Google Play Store, we need to go into settings and then select device preferences and then click on about and scroll down to build and then just keep clicking on it until you get confirmation you've got developer settings. And now when you go back into device preferences you'll see a menu option for developer options. And in here we want to make sure advanced reboot is enabled. Back on your home screen click on the file manager and now you can plug in your USB stick, the one you copied the gapps download onto. Okay there it is untitled, now if I click on it you'll be able to see that the gapps is there. So I'm going to copy this GApp zip from my USB onto my SD card on my Raspberry Pi 4, which we're now using to run Android TV 11 on. So now if I click on the Raspberry Pi SD card, we can see it's there in the root file system. Okay, back on the homepage, if we click on Settings, Device Preferences, Reboot, 
and reboot to recovery. OK, so the Raspberry Pi will reboot into recovery mode and you'll get the following team win window. So if we just swipe to allow modifications and we'll get the following options. We need to choose the install option. Now, if all went well and you did copy the gapp zip file to your root directory on your SD card, you should see it here. And we simply just select it and swipe to confirm flash. Now, the flash shouldn't take that long, up to five minutes at the most. And when that's done, we'll get the option to wipe Dalvik or reboot. We need to click on wipe Dalvik. And then as it says, swipe to wipe. And then finally, we click on reboot system. And if we give this a few minutes, it will finally reboot into Android TV 11. We'll then be presented with the option to set up our controller. Now I'm using my PS4 controller wired, but you could just as easily use a wireless Bluetooth controller. Okay, now it's asking us to set up our back button and our home button. So we just click on the respective buttons on our controller. Now, once you've done that, you'll get the option to select your language. Now I'm going to choose English. And now you get a chance to set up your network connection. So you could set up your Wi-Fi connection if you have one. And then I select continue. And then you get your chance to sign into your Google account. And then you get the option to sign in using your phone or computer or use your remote. I'm going to use my remote. And from here, you just log into your Google account as normal. And then click on accept. For location services, I'm going to do no. And another no here. And no thanks to Google Assistant because it's not working anyway. OK, so we get a nice little introduction here. Your Raspberry Pi is powered by Android TV. Let's walk through the features of your device. Now it mentions here you can get your apps from the Google Play Store. I must say this is pretty cool from the Kongster Kang team. And then it goes on to say we've got the option to talk to Google Assistant. And finally, the option to cast to your TV. And if we do the final click, we're going to get to our home screen. And as you can see, there's a whole lot more going on here. We've got the movies, we've got apps. And if I click on the Add Favorites, I can add my Google Play Store from here. And again, I think I'm going to add YouTube. Now guys, there's a few things we can do to optimize the system on the Raspberry Pi 4. So if we click on Settings and scroll down to Device Preferences, and from here, scroll down to Raspberry Pi Settings. Now there's a number of things you can do here, but I'm going to concentrate on the display resolution, which you can decrease to improve the performance of Android TV on your Raspberry Pi. Now if you scroll down from here, you'll come to the Overclock section. So this is pretty handy. You can overclock your Raspberry Pi 4 straight from here. Now of course, make sure you've got the proper cooling solution on your Raspberry Pi to do this. I think I'm going to go for 2000 MHz. Now this will of course update your config.txt file automatically for you. There's some other cool little options here. You've got the option to enable remote access via SSH. So if you do install this Android version, it's worth a look in here to see what else you can do. Overall, I must say, I'm very impressed what the Kongster Kang team have done here. They seem to make it easier and faster to install Android TV on your Raspberry Pi 4 every time they do a new install. Now today I want to talk about one of the most popular projects for the Raspberry Pi 4, and that is turning it into a retro gaming console. Now there are a few options available to do this, and I have covered Recalbox, which does a similar thing, but with different features, and I'll leave a link in the description on my video covering this. So what is Batracera? Well, it's an open source and completely free to use retro gaming distribution that can be copied onto a USB stick or an SD card. And once it's inserted into your Raspberry Pi 4, it'll boot up into a fully fledged gaming retro console. And the best thing is you don't need to make any modifications to your Raspberry Pi 4. And of course, you must own the games you're going to play on it. Now in this video, I'm going to cover how you go about getting Batracera onto your Raspberry Pi 4, and then how you go about setting it up for the best retro gaming experience. So if that sounds interesting to you, keep on watching. If you're new to the channel and you want to stay up to date with the latest tech tutorials, reviews and unboxings, I do everything including Fire Stick, Raspberry Pi and Android TV tips and tricks. So subscribe and hit the notification button. OK, to do this project we're going to need a few things. The first of these is obviously the Raspberry Pi 4. We're also going to need a mouse. Now I'm plugging this into the Raspberry Pi 4 via its dongle. We need a USB keyboard, the Pi 4 power supply, and a HDMI to micro HDMI cable. And last but not least, we need a micro SD card to install our operating system and games. So in this video, I'm going to be using macOS to flash my SD card with Batasia. But you can also use Windows or Linux systems. Now on your PC, head on over to the Batasia website 
and when you get there, you'll see they do a great job of explaining what they do in terms of the features it offers and how powerful it is. And it's also plug and play. And most importantly, it's open source software. Anyway, to download the software, just click on the download button and that'll take you to the download section. And here you can see just how many platforms Botasia works on from PCs to Apple to Nux and a number of handheld consoles. But what we're looking for is at the bottom and it's the Raspberry Pi section. And as you can see, it works for virtually every Raspberry Pi out there. So I'm using a Raspberry Pi 4, so I'm going to click on the Raspberry Pi 4. And this will download the zip file to my PC. Now once the zip file is downloaded, we need to transfer this onto an SD card. And I use a piece of software called the Raspberry Pi Imager. Just open it up and select Choose OS. And then scroll down to Use Custom, as we're using a custom operating system. And from here you need to navigate to where you downloaded the copy of Batrisia. And click on Open. And then click on the Choose SD Card button and select the SD card you've inserted in your PC. Click yes to confirm you're writing the software and that's it. You just give it about five minutes for it to complete writing the software onto the SD card. Now, once Spotter Series on your SD card, take it out of your PC and slot it into your Raspberry Pi 4. And at this point, I would also slot in an empty USB stick into your Raspberry Pi 4 and this will be where you store your games. Okay, so this is your main screen on Botasira. To navigate, I'm using my keyboard with the arrow keys. Now there are a few games pre-installed so you do have some consoles already showing up. Now as you can see, themes wise, it's pretty bland, but it does the job. And later in the video, I'll show you how to install some more exciting themes. So if you scroll over to the All Games section, you'll see we've got quite a healthy selection of games already pre-installed. And the great thing is, they come with a little thumbnail and a pre-roll little video. Now one of the first things you want to do is connect your Bluetooth controller. Now I've got a PS4 controller, so I'm going to connect that now. Now to bring up the main menu, press on your spacebar on your keyboard. Scroll down to Controller Settings and select it. Next, scroll down to Pair Bluetooth Controller and select it. Now at this point, it's scanning for your Bluetooth controller. So I'm going to put my PS4 controller in pairing mode. And almost instantaneously, you'll get a pairing. Okay, now I've got my controller connected, I can show you a few more tweaks on the system. And first, if we click on the Options menu, we'll get a quick access menu. And from here, we can skip the songs on the main menu. And we can also launch the screensaver. But most importantly, we can view the Buttersera manual which believe me, in today's gaming systems, a built-in manual is pretty rare. And it literally covers everything from controller settings to menu systems to themes and most importantly, in-game controller settings. So if you do have any issues, it's well worth taking a look here. It covers just about everything. Now getting the games on your system is pretty straightforward. Just head on over to the main menu and make your way down to system settings. And here you can see we've got quite a few options. Make your way down to the bottom Oh, and there's an overclock section here where you can set the CPU frequency to turbo, high and non. Anyway, moving down to storage device, we need to switch this to any external. This will let us use our USB stick for game storage. Now you will get a message saying you need to reboot to apply the new configuration. Now this will create a folder system on your USB stick for each gaming system and it's where you're going to place your ROMs. So head down to shutdown system and restart the system and confirm. Once it's restarted, click on the main menu and scroll down to network settings. And here, make sure you're connected to your network and take a note of your IP address. And then head on over to your computer and open up your file explorer and make a new network connection. Now on my Mac, I'm going to click on new network connection and then type in the IP address of the Raspberry Pi 4. Give it a moment and you'll be prompted for a password. Now here, I just signed in as guest, so I don't need a password. And click on connect. Okay, we are now in the share drive of Batis here on the Raspberry Pi 4. So the important folders here are the BIOS folder and our ROMs folder, where our games go. Now you can see here we've got every single system you can imagine here, from Sega to Nintendo and PlayStation, and everything in between. So what we need to do is copy over our games from our computer to the relevant folders here on the Raspberry Pi 4. So I'm going to open up a new file explorer and copy across my games. And once you're done, you can close your connection to your Raspberry Pi 4 from your computer, and then just reboot the Raspberry Pi 4. And if we look in the All Games folder, we'll see that we've got all our games. And of course, the only issue here is that we've got no thumbnails, apart from the games that came pre-installed. Now to fix this, we need to go into the main menu and scroll down to Scrape. And from here, we need to select Screen Scraper as the Scrape From site. And for Image Source, I'm going to select Screenshot. And for Box Source, I'm selecting Box 2D. And for Logo Source, it's Wheel and make sure Scrape Ratings is selected, and also Scrape Videos. This will give us a preview video for each game. And then just scroll down to Scrape Now and select it. Now you can also add a filter, and I've selected only missing media. And what this does is, it will only download content for games that are missing thumbnails. And we can also individually select the systems. Here you can see I've just selected all of them. 
and finally just click on the start button and as you can see it will start downloading the content you can see there's a little progress box in the top right hand corner now i'm just going to speed up the video here and this process shouldn't take more than 10 minutes depending on the speed of your internet connection once it's finished you'll get a little message at the top of the screen saying scraping finished update games list to apply changes so let's just do that press the back button and scroll up to game settings and select update games list press yes to confirm and just like that your games list is refreshed so let's have a quick look and yeah it looks like it's pretty much got all of those games and you get a little preview video as well for each game now the next thing i want to cover is how to change the theme on batusia so going from this to something like this which is definitely a more interactive experience and the way to do this is to download themes so we go into the main menu and scroll down to updates and downloads and scroll down to themes and select okay so now we are in the themes downloader and as you can see we've got quite a few themes here we could download we've got dragon balls epic noir es theme forever flat color flat white fundamental basically tons of themes now i do like the look of this batasia club so we just select and confirm install and that's been added to our download queue now i also like the look of this gpi fusion slice so i'm going to download that and add it to the queue okay so we've now got two downloads pending now of course depending on the speed of your network this can take up to 15 minutes to download and you should get a message telling you it's been downloaded and installed so the next thing we want to do is actually apply the theme so if we click on back and back again to the main menu and scroll up to ui settings and you just select your theme set from here so now in total i've got three so i'm going to choose the batasira club one and then if you totally back out of the menu system it'll automatically change to that theme and there you go guys we are in the new theme the batasira club and as you can see guys this is a much more engaging experience we've got those graphics we've got those colors personally i love the carousel look with the menu system but if you're not a fan of it you can change it in the theme settings so let's test one of the games so i'm going to go into psp and i'm going to select it to confirm so guys this is pretty amazing you get a video pre-roll of the game you get a full description of the game when it was released and you even get the original box art for it now this is all thanks to the scraping we did earlier gotta say i love this game so it's just like the original you select your players and off you go now i'm just going to show you a bit of gameplay so enjoy and sit back Ready? Beat him up, guys! Triumph or die! Okay, so if you do want to change the way the theme works, you can go into the main settings and scroll down to user interface settings and then scroll down to theme configuration and it's here you can change the way the whole theme works okay guys so that is a brief overview of batasia on your raspberry pi 4. now don't forget if you do get yourself in a muddle there is that manual available from the quick menu and all that remains for me to say is that if you enjoyed the video give us a like and please do consider subscribing for more great content like this now today i'm going to be looking at installing the raspberry pi tv hat onto my raspberry pi 4. so what is the raspberry pi tv hat well the tv hat allows you to receive and decode digital tv streams onto your raspberry pi through its onboard dvb t2 tuner then you can watch these streams on any computer tablet or phone connected to the same network as the pi the software recommended to decode the streams and view the content is called tv head end so in this video i'm going to show you how i built up the raspberry pi tv hat and connected it to my raspberry pi 4 and i'll show you how i installed the tvn software and then scanned for channels and created playlists which allows me to watch live tv on my phone tablet or computer now i picked up my raspberry pi from amazon for a few pounds and i've left links in the description of where you can get it okay guys without further ado let's get on with this okay guys so here it is the raspberry pi dvb tv micro hat as you can see my box got crushed a bit by the delivery man but no harm done so on the back we've got some tech specs but let's just get stuck in so in the box we've got two packets one contains the board itself and the other one contains some headers and screws okay taking a look at the board itself you can see that it's basically the same size as a raspberry pi zero and it is in fact designed to sit on top of a raspberry pi zero but i'm going to be using my raspberry pi ford okay let's take a quick look at the screws and standoffs oh no don't do this at home folks now the board comes with an aerial adapter and some screws and a 40-way header and a set of mechanical spacers 
So the first thing I'm going to do is connect the aerial adapter to the Pi TV. And it's quite straightforward, you push it in until it clicks. Now the next thing I'm going to do is attach the 40-way header directly onto the Raspberry Pi 4 board. And again, you just need to firmly push it down until you hear a small click. And then it's just a case of positioning the Pi TV onto the Raspberry Pi via the headers. Just be careful to line up the holes with the prongs. And again, you should hear a small click and you know it's in place. Now the next bit can be a bit tricky. You need to put three spaces between the Pi TV and the Raspberry Pi 4 and then screw them in firmly with the plastic screws provided. You really could do with three hands here. So once that's done, you should have three screws firmly in place at the bottom. Now don't worry about one of the sports, it seems to be resting on one of the chips, but that's the way it's designed. Now once you've done all this, connect up a mouse and a keyboard. Also connect an aerial to the aerial adapter of the Pi TV. Once you've booted up, open up a command prompt and type the following. sudo apt-get install tv head end and then type enter. Type yes for continue. OK, so it's going to ask you to create an account with a username and password. So my username is techfigure. Press OK. And now you just type in your password. Make sure you remember it. And here it's just letting us know where we can find the web front end for the TV head head software. So just point your web browser to the IP address of your Raspberry Pi and that port number. OK, so let's click OK. So the next part of the installation should take a few more minutes. And that's it guys, TV head end has been installed on your Raspberry Pi. Let's move on to the next step. Okay, so I'm back on my computer now and I'm gonna to connect to my Raspberry Pi via its IP address and the port number they gave us, which I've highlighted here. Now I'm gonna input my username and password and we're into the web front end of TV head end. So it looks fairly complicated, but don't worry, I'm gonna guide you through this. Now we select our language first, which in my case is English UK. Next we select our electronic program guide language, which is also English for me. Now for the following fields, just add star for the username and password. This allows anyone on your network to log on to the TV server and watch TV programs. You can leave the top field blank and just click on the save and next button. And here we're just interested in the network two fields. You can see it's automatically selected our Sony tuner. So we just need to select network type and there's only one choice. Okay guys, we're on the final straights. Now this next one is quite important. You need to select your local transmitter. Now after doing a bit of research, I found out my local transmitter is Sun Coalfield. You just need to find out where your local transmitter is. And there is a website tool on the Freeview website. Now when you select Save and Next, it will start scanning for the channels available to you. And this can take up to 15 minutes. Now as the scan progresses, the values in the Fan Muxes and Fan Services field increase. Which is a good sign, which means you're getting some channels. Once it gets to 100%, press Save and Next. And then just tick all three of these boxes. And that's it guys, we're done. TV head end is all set up and ready to go. We just need to set up how we're going to view these channels. And as you can see, I've got a fairly generous selection of TV channels here. And we've got various tabs up top for settings. And below that, we've got filters to filter out the channels. By the way, we've also got some radio channels, so we can filter out radio channels and TV channels. Okay, let's try clicking on a channel. And I think I'm going to try channel 1. Now there is sand, but I forgot to record it. So that looks great, there's no stuttering or screen tearing. Next I'm going to try channel 2, and again there's a slight pause. Now an easier way of viewing all these channels would be to create a playlist, and then you could view that playlist on any device using software like VLC. So let's open up VLC and begin creating this playlist. The first thing we want to do is select the channel and click on play program. This will open up the channel in your browser. Now what you want to do is copy the address in the address bar and go over to VLC and click on open media. Select the network tab and paste in the address. Then click on open and you can test if the channel works. You can then click on stop. And what you want to do is save this as a playlist and give it a meaningful name. I'm calling it the channel name and I'm saving it to my desktop. Okay, so we repeat this process, pick a channel, get the link and paste it into the VLC player test to see if it works and then also save this as a playlist on your desktop and name the playlist the channel's name. Okay so we have two playlists on my desktop each containing one channel. Now we have these files on the desktop we need to do a quick edit of these files so just open them up with a text editor. Now what you'll see here is that it actually lists the program that the channel was displaying. Now I'm going to replace this with the channel name so what this will do is display the channel name on the screen when you select the channel in VLC. And here I'm doing the same to the second playlist. 
Now, what we're going to do next is use VLC to combine these two playlists into one playlist. I've taken both my playlists from a desktop and dragged them over to VLC. Now, this has created a new playlist containing the two channels. Now, ideally, you'd add more channels following the previous process, but I'm just adding two channels for demonstration purposes. As you can see, you can now see the channel name on the bottom there. OK, so what we're going to do is save this as a new playlist and I'm going to call it TV Channels. So now this is the file you can share between your devices. And as long as you have something like VLC on each of these devices, you can open this file and watch your TV channels. And we can take a quick look at it and see what it looks like inside. And as you can see, we have the channel names on each of the listings. Now I'm going to transfer this file to my phone and show you how it works on the phone. OK, so over on my phone, the first thing I'm going to do is open up VLC and I'm going to find that channel playlist I transferred over. Now I have in fact added more channels to that playlist. And the first of these is channel 4. So this is a big room. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still, it's still got the outside in it. Yeah. Now if you touch on the screen, you can select any of the other channels. On the human body, which finger is colloquially known as a pinky? Now you can view the channels in landscape mode and this will make the channels fill up the whole phone screen. But it doesn't seem to show up well when you're screen recording a phone. Now the other great thing here is you can use all the great features of VLC, which includes minimizing the screen, therefore allowing you to multitask. OK guys, and it's as simple as that. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below and I'll have a look. So if you found this video helpful, give us a like and maybe even a subscribe. Now this is just a quick video to introduce you to PinOS. Now picture this, wouldn't it be amazing if you could switch between operating systems with your Raspberry Pi? on the fly. Just imagine having multiple operating systems available at your fingertips. You could use a full desktop OS like Ubuntu Mate and then still be able to get high video performance by booting into your Liberalec OS. Now this is what having a smart bootloader like Pin or Noobs lets you do. But Pin OS differs from Noobs. Firstly, it's got a load more OS variants you can install from it. And it's got a load of more features than Noobs. Things like reinstallation, replacement of individual operating systems, backup and restore operating systems, and even disk checking and recovery features. Heck, it's more of an OS administration tool. Anyway, in this video, I'm going to show you how to install it and then use it to boot into several operating systems, all from one SSD or USB stick. So without further ado, let's get started. If you're new to the channel and you want to stay up to date with the latest tech tutorials, reviews and unboxings, I do everything including Fire Stick, Raspberry Pi and Android TV tips and tricks. So subscribe and hit the notification button. OK guys, let's take a quick look at the options you get with PinOS. So along the top, we can see we've got various tabs labelled with various categories. And as you can see under each tab we've got various operating systems which correspond to those categories. So under the general tab we've got Raspberry Pi OS, the 32-bit version, and we've got Android in the form of Lineage, version 16 and 17. We've got Twister OS, one of my favourites, Ubuntu. And under the media tab we've got Liberalec, which is going to be your Kodi build. And we've got Lineage OS, the TV build, which is Android TV, which is pretty cool. Now I have already done an install and review video on this Android TV build, so check it out in my playlist. Now moving along to the minimal tab, we've got our minimal builds here. In other words, more smaller file sizes, giving us our no frill systems, as in the Raspberry Pi OS Lite, which has no desktop environment. Next we've got our utilities tab. This is where you can add or partition your SD card as you wish, but it's all automatically done anyway. OK, moving along to the games tab, we've got all our favourites. We've got Laka, Botasura, and we've got RetroPie. Again, I've done videos on all these systems. Just take a look at my playlist in the description below. And lastly, we've got our testing tab with testing systems. So as you can see, there's plenty of systems to choose from here. And as long as your hard drive is big enough, you can install all of these and then choose to boot up any of these systems from one hard drive. You can install PinOS straight from your Raspberry Pi running PiOS. So currently I've got PiOS running from the SD card on the Raspberry Pi. Now I'm going to install PinOS on an external drive and I'm going to plug it in now. As soon as you plug it in, you're going to get this message pop up. Just cancel this. So first of all, we're going to need to format this drive and to do this, I'm going to use PiImager. Click on Choose, scroll down and select Arrays and then click on Choose SD Card and select your hard disk or USB drive. And finally, just click on Write and click Yes to confirm. And once it's done, you'll get the following message. Click Continue and close the program. So the next thing we need to do is download PinOS. So open up a web browser and type in pin download and press return and select pin download sourceforge.net. And from here we just click on download the big green button and it should eventually start downloading the zip file. And as you can see it started downloading and it shouldn't take too long as it's only 50 meg. Now once it's complete, I'm just going to click on show in folder 
Okay, I'm going to close down some of these windows and make it a bit clearer. Now we're going to unzip this file here. Okay, now we can delete the original zip file as we don't need it anymore. And now we're going to copy all these extracted files to our external hard disk. So I'm highlighting all the files. Now I just need to find my external hard disk in the side panel here. And you can see it's just at the top here, so I'll just drag and drop. Now that shouldn't take more than a few minutes. Now once that's done, we're going to shut down the Raspberry Pi and take out the SD card with the Pi OS system on it, but leave your hard disk plugged in with the PinOS system on it, so when it does next boot up, it will boot up into PinOS. Now on reboot, you'll get the following screen, just be patient, and you should come up with a final PinOS splash screen. Now the first message you're going to get is network required, but I can close this as I'm using a wired connection. Ok, this is the main window where you choose the operating systems you're going to put on your external hard drive. Now I think I'm going to choose my favourite operating system, which is Twister OS. Now on the bottom it lets you know how much space you've got left on your hard drive. And this space will decrease as you add more operating systems. Ok, as you just saw, I added LibreOLEC, which can run my media centre. And also I think I'm going to add Retropie for my gaming needs. Ok, the only thing that remains to be done is click on the install button on the top left hand corner. Now this will install all the operating systems that I've chosen. A window will pop up, just click yes to confirm, and we're off. Now install time varies depending on a few factors, including how many operating systems you've chosen, the speed of your media drive, but while it's installing, you do get some entertainment by means of post chart of what you're installing. Now once it's finished, you'll get the following message, just click on the OK, and it will reboot. Now it will boot back automatically into PinOS, and you can see here that it's confirmed that Twister OS is installed. And if we click on the main menu here and scroll across to maintenance, we can see in fact that there are three installations, and that's RetroPie, Twister OS, and LibreOLEC. And if we click on the config.txt button, we can edit each config.txt file for each of the operating systems individually. Now there's some interesting and useful things we can do in the maintenance menu. For one, we can click on the info button and we get information about the operating system. And by clicking on the alias button, we can give the operating system an alias. And let's say we're having some issues with the installation. If we highlight it and then click on the fix it button, you get the option to repair the OS, so we can do a file system check, rerun partition, and show debug log. Now if things go really wrong, you can choose to reinstall the operating system. You can also replace individual operating systems with another operating system. Now if we scroll across to the main menu again, and click on the exit button, we can choose which operating system we boot into when we restart. Now I'm going to click on Twister OS, and then click on the boot button. The Pi 4 will now reboot into Twister OS. And as you can see, we booted nicely into Twister OS, one of my favourite operating systems on the Raspberry Pi 4. It works flawlessly. It borrows the best of both worlds from Windows and the Mac operating systems. You've got your app drawer here, just like the Mac OS system. And of course you've got your menu bar, just like Apple at the bottom of the screen. And of course, just like Windows, there's your normal menu system at the top. And it comes pre-installed with a shed load of apps. Basically anything you'll ever need on the Raspberry Pi 4. And the Chrome browser comes pre-installed for all your media needs. Now I've done a couple of videos on Twister OS and installing it on your Pi 4. Just take a look in my playlist. Ok, we're going to shut down and reboot and we're going to go back into PinOS to reboot into another operating system. Now after this rainbow screen disappears, you'll need to keep on pressing on the shift key until you get into the menu. Now to boot into another system that you've already installed, you need to press on the exit key at the top. That'll take you to your OS boot screen and from here you can choose the operating system you're going to boot into. Now do choose your operating system quickly here as it's counting down. And if you don't choose an operating system to boot into, it'll just load the previous operating system. So I'm going to select LibreOLEC now for my media needs. And then press on the boot button and it'll reboot automatically. Ok, so that's booted in nicely into version 18.9 LIA. Click on next and it's just a basic install. So you need to add all your add-ons and libraries. Now if you do want to know how to set up LibreOLEC, I have done a video on it and it's in my playlist on the Raspberry Pi 4. Now again we're going to shut down and boot back into PinOS. Ok guys, so we are back into PinOS and from here we can choose our operating system again or we can modify any of the settings on our operating systems. Anyway guys, I hope you found this video helpful and if you did, give us a like and maybe even a subscribe. Hey guys, it's Kay, I hope you're all well. Now in today's video, I'm going to show you the easiest way of getting retro gaming on your Raspberry Pi 4. Now if you do like this kind of content, please do consider subscribing and giving us a like. Ok, so I am in fact talking about Recalbox and the latest version 7.2. And if you head on over to their website, 
you can in fact see how it converts your Raspberry Pi into an all-in-one retro gaming console. And the great thing is, it's open source, which means it's free to use. And it's compatible with a wide selection of game systems and consoles, from the earliest arcade systems, all the way up to the 32-bit systems, like the PlayStation. And there's some new impressive features in this new version, with things like online updates so you get the latest optimizations for your emulators. And there's a 5 player mode, so if you've got up to 5 controllers, you can connect them all to the same Raspberry Pi, and play with your mates. And just about any Bluetooth controller will work. There's a rewind function, so if you mess up in the game, you can go back and replay it. Now they state 100 gaming systems are supported, with 40,000 games, which is amazing. Now to download Recalbox onto your Raspberry Pi, just head on over to the top of the page and click on the download box. Now as you can see it's available for a variety of systems and setups, but we're going to choose the Raspberry Pi 4. So the cool thing here is you can install Recalbox on any of the Raspberry Pis you can think of, from 0 all the way up to 4. So I'm getting it for the Pi 4, and I'm going to click on the Mac version, because I'm using a Mac to transfer it onto my SD card. And that's it guys, we're done on the website, we just wait for it to download. Now we're also going to need something to flash the recal box ROM onto your SD card. And I'm using the Pi Imager. I've left a download link in the description below where you can get this. Now once you've installed Pi Imager, open it up and click on the Choose OS button. Then scroll your way down to Custom and it will bring up a box. Just navigate to where you downloaded the recal box ROM and select it. Click the Open button. Next we need to click on Choose SD card. And of course make sure you have your SD card inserted in your PC and select it. And finally click on Write and click yes to confirm. You'll then proceed to write and then verify recal box on your SD card. It should take about 2-3 minutes. Once it's complete you'll get the following message, just press continue. Then remove your SD card from your PC and insert it into your Raspberry Pi and boot up. Now the first boot up shouldn't take more than 5 minutes, but while it's booting up you do get some information about the latest features. And as you can see there is a lot more features than I mentioned earlier. And of course we've got multi-controller support and all the buttons are mapped out the box. And if you didn't know already, the main interface for Recallbox is Emulation Station. And personally, I think the system screens are pretty cool. You get a listing of the games you've got installed, and a picture of the console you've currently selected. And another cool feature is, you've got a multi-search feature. So you can search for any game across all the systems you've got installed. And another cool feature is shortcuts on your gamepad during the game, which are useful if you want to do some creative playing. Now adding games to your system is pretty straightforward, you've got three methods. You can simply plug in a USB drive with all your games on it, or you can insert an SD card with all your games on it. And thirdly, you can access your games ROMs via your network, directly on your Windows PC. Which is a bit of a game changer, it's the first time I've come across this. Ok guys, we're nearly there, and we're in. Now, the recall box download does come with some games installed, and that's why we've got all these game systems showing up on our menu. So, let's take a quick look around. Now I've got my PS4 controller hooked up via USB so I'm able to scroll through all the emulators available. Now this list will change if you add different ROMs from different systems. Now currently I've got no PlayStation Portable listed, but if I add PlayStation ROMs to the shared drive on the SD card, the next time I boot up the PlayStation Portable will show up here with all the ROMs listed. But by default Recalbox does come with some ROMs with each of the systems listed. As you can see here, the Mega Drive has got several games already installed. So let's give Yazzie a quick try. As you can see the interface on Recalbox is absolutely stunning, it's very smooth, so this is your classic platform game, very colourful I might add. Now the great thing here is, you can see how easy it was for me to get Recalbox installed and working. Very easy for a newcomer to the Raspberry Pi to get a setup and running. Now another classic that comes pre-installed with the Recal ROM is Kong. So as you can see, you can get set up fairly easily without having to install any ROMs. As I think Recalbox comes with around 33 games, distributed between the emulators that are already installed. Now, if you have any issues with the buttons on your controller, you can reconfigure them. Pressing select on the controller will bring up the main menu and just head on over to controller settings. And from here you can also pair a Bluetooth controller. Now, going back to the main menu, you can also connect to your Wi-Fi network. Just select network settings and then scroll down to Wi-Fi SSID and then from here select your Wi-Fi network. Now, getting your personal ROMs onto the recal box is quite straightforward. All you need to do is remove the SD card from the Raspberry Pi and insert it into your PC. You'll get two drives that show up, Recall Box and Share. Now you want to double click on the Share drive to open it up. Now on the Share folder on the SD card, open up the ROMs folder. Now in here you're going to find all the emulators that are supported by Recalbox. So all you need to do is copy over all the ROMs you have into the corresponding folders. 
So, for example, I'm copying over my N64 ROMs from my PC onto the corresponding N64 folder on the SD card. Now, I'm also doing the same for the PlayStation Portable. Now, once you've copied over all your personal ROMs onto the SD card, just remove it and put it into your Raspberry Pi and boot up. As you can see, the PlayStation Portable and the games have appeared on Recalbox. Now, the only thing is, there's no artwork with the game. There's a simple fix for this, and I'll show you later on in the video. So, I'm going to play some Street Fighter Alpha. If some of your ROMs don't have any artwork, you can install them within Localbox. Head on over to Scraper within the main menu and click on Scrape Now. From here you can filter out what systems you want to scrape out artwork for. So currently I've got all 37 systems selected. Now once I press Start, it will look at all the ROMs I have under each system without artwork and start searching online for artwork for them. So overall, I'll give the Recal Box experience 10 out of 10. It's absolutely fantastic for beginners. They can get started straight away. Anyway guys, if you found this video helpful, give us a like and maybe even a subscribe. And I'll see you all in the next one.